everybody. I'm your host Scott Raff and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am here to tell you a little bit about everything that's happening within Missoula, some city council, you got a lot of different things I'm also talking about, you got a new dub and stuff. I got some pre-critic for you guys where I prejudge movies and games that are coming out this week, whether they need them or not. All right, let's get right into it. Big news, big lot of things that are happening. The U.S. Department of Justice is suing Google. Google has gotten too big. It's considered big tech, and now it's up to the DOJ to break up that monopoly. And that's kind of what the, the deal is. Let's dive into it a little bit more. The Silicon Valley base company has been a forefront of internet browsing and searches, but recently with user information and searches as being generated through personal data has become a major source of information bias and corporate oversight. And with the election coming up has become one of the many platforms that many political figures claim is rigging the election. Uh, the US wants to rein in Google and break up what has been the main source for searches on the internet, a monopoly of information um, as you will. Uh, big tech has become synonymous with big oil, big tobacco, and many other too-big-to-fail corporations. One argument for Google can plainly see that Microsoft, Firefox, and Safari are among those browsers that use Google, with some exception of Bing, which is run through Microsoft. So Bing is also another search engine, but it's not it's quite as big as Google, but Google is basically the one that's being made the example of. Part of having this lawsuit isn't the end of Google, but it's not necessarily even breaking up Google, but it's the uh, the freedom of information kind of deal. And I think it's going to be part of, um, they're not suing for money. The part, Department of Justice doesn't sue for money, but they gather a bunch of uh, uh, states, 11 states are kind of joining forces to be part of this kind of major lawsuit to kind of uh, fix what they think is wrong with the Google system, kind of deep dive into it a little bit more and kind of have a better understanding and most of all, create some regulations when it comes to your internet searches. So Congress has interviewed social media outlets like Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, to explain the 2016 election and how uh, paying for Facebook ads from outside sources may have swayed the election that year. Not sure. There's just a lot of uh, hearsay in terms of that. Uh, lawsuits are not necessarily about money and assets, um, but they're just diving deeper into the tech giant. Of course, Big Tobacco is also dealing with their own issues when it comes to flavor bans. And Missoula is one of those uh, communities that have been uh, given the state right to uh, enforce certain bans and restrictions on tobacco products and stuff like that. And one of them was um, f flavored tobacco. And uh, part of this is vaping products um, in terms of just like flavored tobacco and flavored vaping. Um, so there, uh, Missoula is targeting that. I'll talk a little bit more about it during city council. I have a lot to say about it. And people also have a lot to say in it in a couple quotes that I've already uh, gathered for you guys. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the show. But the most important takeaway from it is, is that the city will finally decide on Monday on whether or not to uh, put a flavor ban ordinance within the city of Missoula. All right. Let's see here. Here's some Montana news. Yellowstone County uh, has reported in 35,000 mail-in ballots have been um, basically delivered to the Yellowstone County Elections Office. Currently, there are 85,000 registered voters in Yellowstone County alone. And so that's a big chunk of their uh, folks who are doing this. Um, Yellowstone County also is moving towards mail-in only ballot with some exceptions. Um, there's, you know, even in Missoula, there is uh, the elections office off of um, Russell, so I know a little bit more about the elections and the ad administrator of elections, uh, Bradley Seaman, who is the uh, administrator for Missoula County Elections, and he's the one kind of overseeing everything, and he rest assured that everything is going to go very smoothly in Missoula County especially. Um, uh, he did a, another talk. Uh, he did a talk earlier with uh, another person who's done um, um, counting ballots, and you guys can check that out through uh, Fort Missoula and MCAT. We did a, a shoot a couple weeks ago. It's called Montana Votes Part 2, uh, Voting 101. You can probably look this up on MCAT's YouTube page, uh, Fort Missoula, Historic Museum at Fort Missoula's YouTube page. You can go to uh, Fort Missoula's uh, Historic Museum, uh, fortmissoula.org, to find these links and more. And, of course, it's Aaron on MCAT and all that stuff. Um, of course, you already know that most of the mail-in had to do with COVID, but Montana has done ballots since the 90s and in Missoula. And of course, I can attest um, that I asked some questions to Bradley Seaman a little bit more about this, and he explained to it that uh, when it comes to uh, you know double voting, so you get more than one ballot, they check your signature, but most of all, they check your name and your address, 
and rather than, you know, like you do a mail-in ballot, but then you go in there and you go try to vote again, the quintessential fraud vote uh, that p many people are worried about. Um, he said that they, he does make sure that they check it and they have county records to reassure that. So when they do that, but if there's any problems, they usually have somebody look at it, but then somebody look at the person who's looking at it to make sure there's no funny business going on. So that's kind of what the city of Missoula is going to be doing. Uh, they're keeping the ballots still sealed until uh, Monday, the day before the election, and then they're going to start counting and going from there. But you have until uh, Tuesday, November uh, 3rd uh, at 8 p.m. to turn in your ballot. But, of course, if you're in line and you're clearly going to uh, vote, 8.05 is okay, as long as you're in there by 8 o'clock. But that's the that's news. But anyways, um, uh, programs. we got some new programs and some old programs that are going to be airing on MCAT. So enjoy. Check them out. And then when I come back, pre-critic. <laughs> Water bath canning can only be used for certain types of food. So we have um, mostly fruits uh, can be water bath canning. Uh, a lot more tomatoes can be water bath canned than there used to be. And we'll talk uh, in a few minutes about why that has changed. Uh, so the basic parts of a water bath canner, this is pretty much it. You have to have a basket in the canner because the jars, if they sit on top of the burner without a basket, uh, there could be some breakage. So you want to be very careful about that. Um, the reason why uh, we call it uh, higher acid foods can be canned safely in water bath canners because it doesn't take as high of a temperature uh, to kill anything that might be harmful. I don't know if uh, people have heard about botulism before. That's kind of a word that scares all of us uh, because botulism is very serious. In fact, it can kill people. It's made people very ill before. And that's why we need to use a pressure canner for other types of foods. Um, the picture of the girl in Freetown with seven layers of eggs on top of her head walking down the street it was just a little too blurry, so we didn't do that one. Uh, again, Peace Corps was great. Lifelong friendships with Sierra Leoneans and with other Peace Corps volunteers. But so it comes to the last 15 years, and, and what I've come to understand is that um, change comes from within. It's not something you can hand off. It's not something you can hand over. It's not something that you can impose if you think you have a good idea and the right plan.
very nice. Okay, and that's the end of my Bora impression because Bora is coming out to streaming on Amazon this Friday. And why not Bora? You know, he was a character from a show, so shows usually have a recurring character, so why not have a, an additional movie? Um, this movie is kind of trying to repeat the same magic from the first one, where a uh, uh, naive, um, young-ish um, um, foreigner comes to the United States to kind of understand America, but at the same time making fun of it. So this is kind of what he's doing in this one, but it's a little more on the nose when it comes to political spectrum. So if you're looking for a movie that's as good as the original, you might want to skip out on that because there's some politics. Because the whole purpose of this film is that um, Borat is basically taking a young girl to be adopted. Uh, and one of the uh, uh, hopefuls is Vice President Mike Pence. So you guys get to enjoy that. Um, it's basically, uh, the best example of Borat is it's an American tale. And instead of Feifel going west, in this case, Borat is just kind of going all over, and he's also coming up with disguises. So it's kind of like Shasha Baron Conan, who's an actor who plays Borat, is basically pretending to be Borat, who's pretending to not be Borat. So that's the that's the rub for this movie. Up next, um, On the Rocks. It's a movie with Bill Murray. It's one of those indie films. You get a little bit of magic. Um, let's get straight forward before I throw shade on some of these movies. I do like Bill Murray period. I like most of his movies, but let's forget all that and let's watch some of his non-Wes Anderson indie type movies, which is kind of a bit much. Uh, the only reason he did Ghostbusters is to do these kind of indie films from back in the day. Do you remember the name of that movie that he uh, uh, wanted to do in the 80s that wasn't Ghostbusters? Didn't think so. Moving on, uh, you get a little bit of Sofia Coppola magic and Rashida Jones acting like she usually does in movies where it's just kind of like... She's kind of reactive. She's she's basically kind of like the straight man when it comes to a comedy. So that's kind of what you might see. Most likely this is dark comedy because Bill Murray hasn't really done any like comedy. So I'm still waiting for another resurgence of like Bill Murray's kind of like an 80s or 90s style Bill Murray where he just had a little more energy when it comes to it. But hey, he's getting older. You can't expect him to do everything like he did before. So yeah, on the rocks. Or that's about their marriage that's on the rocks. I don't know. It's whatever. All right, up next we got a video game and I can't remember what it's called because I have Amnesia. Amnesia Rebirth, this game is basically survival horror. I don't know why I said basically because it is survival horror. And Amnesia Rebirth, uh, you'll forget who you are as a nameless protagonist, like most games, uncover the mystery of where, who, and what you have to do to survive. It's like those games that don't tell you what to do and you gotta figure out on your own, and you have to die so many times just to get to the next level. And you have a couple check marks to feel good about yourself to continue playing, and then you just kind of finish the game. So yeah, I mean, the, the whole thing about this game is it's like, oh, you have to collect all the matches, and it's really dark, so the matches actually go down on your finger. But if you move the camera too fast, the light goes out, and you're in trouble. And I guess the part of the game is that, I guess if you're surrounded by darkness, you also go crazy, because darkness is also... Um, something that's affecting you internally. So there's forces on the outside and inside. So <sighs> what was I talking about? Amnesia, Rebirth. All right, so those are some of the movies that are coming out uh, this weekend as well. Um, I do have a new, pr uh, a new dub and stuff for you guys. And then when I come back, we're going to talk about some big tobacco and how Missoula is dealing with the uh, creating a flavor ban in Missoula. Right I don't want to get you started. I don't want to get you started. I got you started. Oh, this looks chatter, nasty. Chatter. If this is vegan, I don't want it. I don't want anything that's vegan. Uh, you don't even know what vegan is. Well, neither do you. Hum. Now you listen up, kids. You're going to eat it, and you're going to like this stuff. And while you guys are eating, I will distract you from your food through all sorts of wonderful stories about my granddaughter. Do you think milk is vegan? Because I heard a rumor it's vegan. Hmm. Humans aren't supposed to drink not dairy milk. Yeah, I can't drink it. I heard this is, comes from big almonds, and they just want us to buy more of this stuff. I'm not eating this milk. Did you hear that dairy cows, they cause enough carbon monoxide that damages the earth? Do we live on the earth? Yeah. We, yeah. Oh. These people are fascists. Fascists? Adults are fascists. Excuse me, Grandma Mary? What's that? Are you a fascist? Well, I would say we're more communists because we're all suffering the same meal together. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Communism is bad, yeah, but I, really know. Know. Yeah, I guess if everyone agrees, and, to you know, someone, no one's doing better than other people. Well, you know, I grew up in a place where they had fascism. Everyone just kind of did it. It pays to be on the right side of history, I tell you what. I couldn't agree more, my honey darling. Foster mom, foster dad. Don't call us that. Um, I think my oatmeal's on the fritz again. Yeah, it's weird. Mine's just the shape of the bowl. Hmm. Well, I'm hungry enough to eat anything. I lost another tooth. Ugh. Of course, I keep on saying of course with everything. You can probably uh, make a drinking game for that. But let's dive into some city council. Five hours uh, they spent on a lot of things that are happening. They had some annexations. I'm going to kind of gloss over that. There's no need to kind of jump into that. Uh, there were demonstrations um, over the weekend. People holding signs uh, worried about voter suppression as we get closer and closer to the election. Um, here is uh, Robbie Lieben. And he uh, basically uh, is reacting to uh, some of the folks who uh, show up uh, alongside the protests against voter suppression. Um, I guess for voter suppression. I don't know. It's 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 it, it's kind of interesting how uh, when there's protesters there doing one thing, then there's the other protesters there kind of thinking that they're protecting citizens or whatever. I don't know. I, I already kind of showed you what side I'm on, but let's dive into it. Um, I'm very concerned about. Uh, armed vigilantes or militia, whatever we want to call them, uh, either coming to intimidate voters during uh, during the elections or to intimidate or coming to, to demonstrations afterwards. It seems like there's very possibly going to be a close election this year and very possibly demonstrations for either candidate, either presidential candidate and probably the others around town. And I'm concerned about armed people showing up to intimidate them. And I attended a number of the Black Lives Matter demonstrations in, in June. And I just wanted to say that, that I saw, you know, members, armed, armed white people, armed vigilantes walking around with assault rifles with their fingers, a fraction of an inch from the trigger. And I have friends who decided that they could not come to these demonstrations, even though they wanted to, because they were scared. People of color were scared. And the result of that is that some of the organizers, some of the black organizers later on started showing up with sidearms as well because they felt they needed to protect themselves. Um, during one of the demonstrations, um, the organizers decided they needed to move the demonstration to the University of Montana campus because it was a gun-free zone. They did not feel safe in front of the county courthouse. And I, I would say that, you know, we are an open carry state, but we have very clear, um, very clear um, statutes against intimidation. And I would urge you to enforce those statutes both during the election and during any um, any demonstrations that follow. Thank you. Thank you very much. The nice thing about living in Missoula is, as I've been talking to a lot of the election officials and everything like that, mail-in ballots, you really can't suppress too much when it comes to mail-in ballots. Um, so there, there's a, there has to be a lot to do with that. But there's a, if you are very concerned about, you know, voting or anything like that you can always go to your voter page which is done through the county of missoula so make sure you go to myvoterpage.org and uh make sure it's through the missoula because then you know you're on the record all you need to do is have your first and last name and your date of birth and it'll tell you your address and your current status whether or not you're absentee or not you might be able to get an absentee uh a mail-in ballot um coming up soon but if you don't you can always go to the um elections off office off Russell. They have parking for people who just show up to get registered to vote. Um, but they, you know, like always, they always have day of voting registration. So that's that. All right. So, um, let's see, uh, John Engen, uh, responds to, uh, uh, some of the concerns about voting suppression. And this is what John Engen had to say. Um, I have had a conversation with Missoula County Commissioners and election off in the Missoula County Elections Office um, with regard to any support that they might need uh, on Election Day. Um, and so we stand ready to assist uh, 
the planning around that actually belongs to Missoula County uh, and the elections office is the lead agency there. Um, with regard to plans for uh, other civil disturbance, we have a variety of emergency plans that are in place and depending on nature of disturbance, um, we will certainly respond according to policy. Uh, the county covers elections in sort. You know, the city, you know, they don't have to really, they don't do too much. It's mostly falls along the county and the county controls what happens with the election and the city just kind of sits back and just kind of lets the election happen. Uh, to learn more about voting, like always, uh, I, I already mentioned the video with uh, Bradley Seaman, the uh, uh, administrator for Missoula County Elections. He did a, a video with MCAT and Fort Missoula to talk about voting 101. So you guys can enjoy that on YouTube. I'm just plugging this video. It's a, There's a lot of questions that were asked, and it's a really great program to talk more about mail-in ballots and some voter suppression, but it's mostly about the clarity when it comes to Missoula County's elections. Um, mail-in ballots should be out now. Um, you should be able to uh, get your ballots in um, off, off Russell Avenue. There's a basically a drive through drop-off. Uh, people will just take your ballots. You don't even have to put it in the mail. So that's nice. You just drop it over at the elections office off Russell. Moving on, now to the fun part. The Missoula proposed ordinance to uh, ban um, uh, menthonoled cigarettes, flavored cigars, and smokeless tobacco. Uh, as proposed, the ordinance would make it a violation to display and sell flavored tobacco at retail shops within the city, along with five, lo along with locations five miles outside the city limits. Um, as it is a public hearing during COVID, uh, spoiler alert, um, they will not finalize this, this decision until Monday. So you guys have until like through the weekend after you're watching the show, or maybe you already know that. Uh, but with public hearings, they usually uh, have some time for people to give some feedback and whatnot. Without getting too much into it, um, honestly, the jobs that would be affected are the folks who solely distribute the vape juice. Uh, like vape juice stores and whatnot, but the largest argument on preventing the use among children who, whether you agree it or not, uh, a lot of the vaping products and the um, flavored tobacco and all that stuff uh, indirectly um, um, targets children to become smokers because a lot of times nobody really smokes something that tastes disgusting. But if you have something that tastes good, people are going to smoke it and um, vaping has been linked to a, a, a much... Uh, faster dose when it comes to uh, getting tobacco into your system. So it's it can be pretty bad. Oh, nicotine, sorry. I didn't mean to say tobacco. I meant to say nicotine. Okay. Okay, so here we go on. Um, Arlene Whalen from um, Missoula City County Health Department gave the presentation for Missoula, and this is what she had to start off with. Tobacco product use is the leading cause of preventable death and disease in the United States. The tobacco industry needs to recruit replacement users for the thousands of people who die each year from tobacco-related diseases. One of the primary ways that tobacco and vape industries have attracted new users is by selling sweet, fruit, and candy flavored products. Flavors improve the taste and reduce, reduce the harshness of tobacco products, making them more appealing and easier for young people to use. And you're really just deep frying vegetables. They taste better, but are worse for you because they're deep fried. Uh, there are too many studies that show tobacco products are linked to cancer, so don't argue against that. Uh, part of many retailers and stores have said that they do not sell to underage kids, and Arlene says that some stores embrace flavored tobacco products on their shelves, and this is what she had to say. These points of sale strategies increase impulse purchases and normalize the presence of tobacco products in everyday life. Tobacco companies now spend most of their advertising and promotional dollars at the point of sale, making tobacco products more appealing to children, and they also trigger impulse purchases by addicted users seeking to quit. These photos were taken in and around Missoula showing how tobacco products are placed at the front register, near candy, or in the place of candy at varying parts of the counter, and at eye level for children, and are referred to as self-service displays. By having easy access to products makes it easy to grab and go. Kind of how like how you uh, push lottery tickets on me. I'm never going to buy a lottery ticket. But before I get into it, it's also important to note that many bans on flavored tobacco products got put on hold when they decided to, uh, when tobacco FDA raised the um, age of uh, tobacco use from 18 to 21. That just kind of happened. It was like December and it's like, oh, hmm, okay. And that was <laughs> after a couple states, uh, they did a couple emergency bans on flavored uh, 
tobacco products as well, which expired, including Montana. Um, some dropped it, um, and others kind of moved forward following uh, Massachusetts' example, uh, which not only uh, banned flavored, but also vaping altogether. Um, it's crazy to think that uh, um, also many folks believe that vaping was safer than cigarettes. It wasn't. Uh, Meredith Berkman spoke on her experience with one of those vaping companies. This is what she had to say. The catalyst was our discovery in April 2018 that a jewel rep had entered our son's high school through an outside anti-addiction group and without the school's knowledge and without any other teachers present, told the ninth grade students that Juul was totally safe and would receive FDA approval any day. Our congressional testimony and that of our sons about this really disturbing incident uh, in tw July 2019 has been cited by FDA as evidence that Juul marketed directly to minors. And Meredith goes on to talk about a Stanford study saying that one in five national average of high school kids are vaping while in Montana, it's more so in one in three kids, one in three high schoolers vape. Usually kids who start smoking are more likely to smoke through adulthood, um, not just vaping, but to move on to other forms of smoking as well. And many, uh, even adults who are lifetime smokers today, a lot of them who started when they were teenagers um, have a lot of difficulties quitting later on in life. So the sooner you start, the longer it lasts. That seems to be the consensus when it comes to people who start smoking with a couple small exceptions. Uh, Mike Keefe is opposed to the ban and says that they have more to lose if they did sell to underage kids at the current laws. This is what he had to say. Sweet. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone again that this is a crime for the underage possession, purchase, or use, and uh, it's also a crime to provide for them. The uh, city police are stating that it is their policy to cite all individuals they encounter that are breaking these laws, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of hiring signs outside of all of the gas stations and convenience stores, so they must be doing their job appropriately if, uh, if they haven't fired all of their uh, you know, wayward employees. It's something like a $1,000 fine to the individual and a $10,000 fine to the store. I'm certainly not about to risk my, uh, my rent paycheck for the sake of somebody else's kids. Keep in mind, these are kids that I didn't raise. I didn't get to instill in them my values. I don't get to slap the cigarette out of their mouth or discipline them. Um, again, these are the crimes of other people's children. These individuals are being cited for them already. And to hold anyone else accountable for these crimes is a violation of our Fifth Amendment. Of course, Mike went on to say that the FDI did raise the uh, age. So the, did raise the, the FDA with the tobacco company did raise the age um, for tobacco uh, purchases from 18 to 21 to widen the gap between ages that could uh, directly um, connect high schoolers with tobacco products as well. Also mentioned that unregulated products may be sold and created more problems for drug enforcement agencies. Um, John Scher from Massachusetts talks about the uh, business and, and how their state has chosen to ban not only flavored tobaccos, but vaping in general. And this is what John Scher had to say. So if you, but if you do consider including menthol cigarettes and mint wintergreen smokeless, in this ordinance. Let me share with you just a little bit of what happened here in Massachusetts. In late 2019, the state passed a law banning all flavored tobacco and e-vapor effective June 1st of this year. So very much what you guys are looking to do. In fact, exactly what you're looking to do. At the time we warned the legislature of the existing black market for these products and how it would fill the void, significantly reduced excise tax revenue and extreme damage to business of licensed retailers. Despite all this, they passed the law. Let me just give you a little bit of what's happened in just the four months. Since June, all of our warnings have become a reality and continue. Massachusetts cigarette sales are off 23%. The state is on pace to lose $150 million. New Hampshire is going to gain 70 million. Menthol cigarette sales are up 100% and flavored smokeless is up 175%. Rhode Island is going to gain $40 million. Menthol cigarette sales are up 52%. Flavored smokeless is up 47%. Massachusetts banned the sale, of uh, the sale of flavored tobacco, not the use. New Hampshire and Rhode Island easily filled that void. The same will happen in any other district that looks to do the same thing. So you may say, well, this isn't a financial consideration. Okay. But when you abandon a legal, licensed, taxed, and enforced framework for a product that is easily transportable and highly profitable in an illicit environment, you create a host of other issues that, frankly and respectfully, you're unequipped to address. I'll leave you with two takeaways. One, don't conflate the issue. If you are concerned about e-cigarettes and youth, then take action on those products. Don't make the mistake of lumping menthol cigarettes and mint wintergreen smokeless. 
They are not the same products and they do not have the same youth appeal. Not even close. Number two, ask yourself if you're ready to vacate a legal, licensed, taxed, regulated, and enforced framework for these legal age-restricted products and deal with the public health and public safety issues that will result in the void you've left. Like it or not, these will remain legal adult products everywhere else. Thank you very much for your time. In many ways, the argument is, as long as people want something, there is a market for it. But beyond this hopelessness of John who just spoke, uh, there are many ways to help enforce this ban to prevent these products from circulating. Part of the concern for vaping in general is the delivery right to the brain more efficiently. So vaping has always been something that's uh, been a lot more efficient when it comes to um, smoking pretty much anything. Um, kind of like a hookah it has like a, it's like smoking 10 cigarettes at once. Uh, this is kind of like just like not as bad as 10 cigarettes. Don't, don't, don't get me don't misquote me or anything like that. But it's pretty bad when you have a cleaner source to your brain and your bloodstream. Um, so many, uh, most smoking products and part of this is that most tobacco and, co and companies have been grandfathered in over the years and, commonly, and common knowledge that smoking is bad for you was just met with don't smoke. If you don't like something, you don't have to do it. I mean, that was possibly the, the, one of the constant arguments that tobacco and big tobacco has, you know, you don't have to buy their products, but at the same time, um, you should always think about who is manipulating you to buy this over this thing, buy this, don't buy that. Jennifer Newbold, former school board member and mother, uh, reflects on the current folks opposed to the ban. And this is what she had to say. I think we all recognize the danger of tobacco. Um, and some may argue that tobacco use is a personal choice. In fact, that's an argument that we've heard this evening. And I don't disagree with that. I do disagree though with what I see as an immoral targeting of kids in an effort to get them using tobacco at a young age. That is not okay and that should not be legal. Some may also contend this is an unfair infringement on business. Uh, I personally don't believe that um, any business or financial interest is acceptable to put before the health and safety of our community's children. And finally, Christian Page Nee, uh, American Cancer uh, Society says retailers shouldn't have to regulate users. And this is what she had to say. The products um, are the problem. Responsible retailing is just not enough to stop big tobacco from targeting youth with enticing kid flavor, friendly flavors. Um, youth gain access to flavored tobacco products in multiple ways. The problem is, if flavored products are allowed for sale anywhere in the community, kids will be able to get them. I was hoping that the city was going to uh, speak on this a little bit more, but they're probably going to speak more in length on it next Monday when they have the final vote on it. They just want to open the public hearing, and next week, next Monday, they're probably going to have another semi-long meeting. Uh, this one was five hours, but I just kind of wanted to wrap up um, some of this that you can find out more information. <laughs> yes, you guessed it, ci.missoula.mt.us, but also look for your Montana voter page, your my my voter page um, for more information about registered to vote, um, if you're mail-in ballot registered, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's a great resource for anybody who needs more information on that as well. And like always, they're taking ballots from nine to five, Monday through Friday, um, if you just wanna drop it off uh, before, after work, during work, lunch break, whatever. Um, and they're gonna go on until 8 p.m. November 3rd, AKA election day. So you guys can check all that out and learn more by going on to the county's website. Much like the city's website, uh, it's, instead it's a co.missoula.mt.us uh, opposed to the city's website, ci.missoula.mt.us. A lot of wonderful websites for you guys to enjoy. Get involved with uh, government, get permits, all sorts of things with those websites and more. But that pretty much does it for your city council report. Here is your most latest um, COVID report from the city county health department. Here, check it out. And then when I come back, a more MCAT news. Hi, my name is Cindy Farr and I'm the incident commander for the Missoula City County Health Department's COVID-19 response. Today is Wednesday, October 21st, and this is my COVID briefing. First, let's run through the numbers. We've now had 1,782 cumulative positive cases of COVID-19 in Missoula County to date, with 46 new cases reported since yesterday. We've had 1,195 recoveries, 
In the past week, the number of Missoula County residents who have died from COVID-related complications has nearly doubled. Last week, we had had five deaths, and as of today, we have now had nine. Our condolences go out to the family, friends, and loved ones of those that we have lost. Missoula, 12 Missoula County residents and 11 non-county residents are currently hospitalized in Missoula County. We now have 579 active COVID-19 cases, and we have currently identified over 1,550 close contacts. Those active cases and their close contacts remain in isolation and quarantine, and they're being supported as needed. Just a reminder that all of these numbers, as well as the graphs and figures um, associated, are on our website at missoulainfo.com. You can also find some more detailed information, such as um, age ranges, and you can see the charts of, of how our cases have changed over time. The state of Montana is now reporting 24,712 COVID cases, which is up 624 new cases from yesterday. There are now 9,352 active cases with 345 active hospitalizations across the state. And there have been 275 deaths related to COVID-19 statewide. According to Harvard Global Health, Montana is now ranked as the third highest state in the country for COVID-19 risk. This is based on the average number of people who have become infected with COVID-19 per 100,000 people. The University of Montana has had 272 cumulative UM-associated cases since the beginning of fall semester, which is up two since yesterday. There are currently 53 active cases associated with the University of Montana. We've seen a really good decline in the number of cases associated with the University of Montana in the last week. So I'd like to talk a little bit about case investigation and contact tracing. After the surge in cases that we've been getting for the last couple of weeks and that we are continuing to get, we're working as quickly as possible to get more staff hired to do case investigation and contact tracing. In addition, um, Health Department internal staff did some additional training last week and we had an additional dozen people add in extra hours and in some cases get pulled from their regular duties to help get through our, some of our case investigation. We're continuing that approach this week, offering health department staff that haven't already been involved in the response, the effort to um, take a similar training and help with contact tracing. The decision to do this was data informed and supported by leadership. We have a sense of duty when, when needed and it's all hands on deck. Um, our staff has stepped up and they continue stepping up to help provide us with that additional support. We know that this training and this approach is just a stopgap measure that will help us um, push through the existing delayed notifications. We are doing this while also simultaneously expanding our staffing capacity. While we are getting caught up on contact tracing, I wanna share some tips for possible close contacts. If a friend or family member lets you know that they have officially have COVID and they're letting you know in case you may have been a close contact, consider what a close contact is. Were you within six feet for, or less for 15 minutes or more? And remember that that time is cumulative. So if you were close together for five minutes on three separate occasions, you would still be a close contact. Also keep in mind that someone is contagious for two days before they develop symptoms. You also wanna consider the place that you spent time with someone. Um, space six feet apart outdoors in a park is less of a risk than sharing close quarters in a home or office space and being within that six feet. Since we are delayed, we encourage you that if you think you are a close contact based on a heads up from a friend, a coworker, or a family member, that you stay home and start monitor monitoring yourself for symptoms while our staff while you wait for our staff to notify you. There are steps that you can take to reduce unnecessary opportunities for COVID exposure and transmission. So next I want to talk about inspections and closures. Inspections are routine standard practice at all times in public health, whether it's verifying that foods are stored at appropriate temperatures in restaurants or if sanitizing is happening in bars or verifying that businesses are following the plans that they submit to us for things like, like wells and septic systems. So why are we increasing our inspections now? This was a data-informed decision to increase inspections to help mitigate the opportunities for COVID exposure and transmission in places where people gather or congregate, like licensed establishments, including bars, restaurants, and other places. 
When we visit, it's not only looking at ownership and management compliance with current rules and orders, but also verifying that the patrons that are attending these establishments are also in alignment with current rules and orders, which are all things that increase the safety for individuals and for our broader community. Our staff are there to help. They're there to help business owners understand what the current rules and requirements and expectations are, as well as how to comply with those across different settings, because things will look different in bars, restaurants, retail stores, and box stores. While we accept and track public comment about compliance and complaints about non-compliance, that is not the only factor driving our inspections. Um, our environmental health staff routinely engage in conversations with licensed establishments and businesses, many of which they've had long-standing, good working relationships with. If and when an inspection does occur, our health department staff are there representing public health and ensuring that public safety is a priority in each establishment. They make observations and they take notes. They discuss options and ideas with owners that might be struggling with compliance in their unique settings. And order to close is an absolute last resort. Our staff really strive to find compliant, creative solutions with business owners upstream. Sometimes a conversation is not enough and the staff may need to inform an organization of specific criteria that they must address by a certain date in order to be in compliance. But there are basically many, many different steps that occur before an official order um, occurs. So these inspections do occur at big box stores, chain stores, local businesses alike. Please take a look at our website at MissoulaInfo.com for guidance documents for businesses and organizations, as well as guidance from the CDC. We've also recently revised the document, what to expect if and when a staff member or employee tests positive for COVID-19, so you can also find that on our website. The other thing that I just want to remind people about is that in the times of COVID, it's really important to reframe your activities. For instance, going to a bar isn't going to a bar for a dance party or a live music event where people will be shoulder to shoulder. Going to a bar now is for accessing the goods and services that they provide. Perhaps you need a change of scenery from your home or you just want to support a local business, but it isn't the same and we really need to try to shift our thinking around that. Our goal at, in public health is to help these businesses stay open and remain open. This means that owners need to create and implement compliant safety measures and that everyone as patrons really need to abide by those local rules and orders in those establishments. Some of the things that we've seen during site visits um, that we just want to remind people of is that face coverings are required when you're not seated at a table. If you're standing, waiting to be seated, going to the restroom, you must wear the face covering. Unassociated groups of people should not be seated fewer than six feet from one another. There should be no standing, no mingling, and no large groups. Staff can and should continue enhanced safety in the back of the house with their colleagues, keeping the face covering on, washing your hands, all of those preventative measures. And daily pre-shift health checks have really proved to be very effective at catching someone with symptoms early and getting them out of the public environment to reduce that spread. Okay, so that was a lot of information um, for today. Tomorrow I'll post another video talking about Halloween safety and prevention, and I'll also be talking about hospitalization data and why we keep a really close eye on that. So that's it for my briefing for today. As always, you can subscribe on YouTube under my name, Cindy Farr, that's C-I-N-D-Y-F-A-R-R. -R. You can click that little notification bell so you get notified when additional videos are uploaded. You can follow us on Facebook. You can check out our website at MissoulaInfo.com and you can call 258-INFO if you would like to schedule a test for COVID-19 if you're having any symptoms or if you just have general questions about COVID-19. So until tomorrow, everyone, stay healthy. As we wrap up the rest of the show, I just want to thank you guys for joining me. As always, you can go to MCAT.org for more information. Uh, big news items that's happening within MCAT as well is that we are officially uh, going to be going into the library. <laughs> I know, we're more library news that is kind of like, are we going to be in there? Are we going to be open to the public? But so far, um, as of right now, this week is kind of weird because MCAT is moving literally every the last push of moving in to the new library so we'll be basically working out of the new library officially starting friday um but more in in terms of public producers i'll let you know a little bit more um i'm, I'm sure things might change next week when i do my show but 
as of right now, I believe that they're going to try to have a November 5th soft opening. No big grandeur opening, but that's hopefully they want to remove the gate around there and just have people to have access to the building and whatnot. But people have been coming and going inside the building. No hard hat required, but you have to be a library staff official to go in there. But allegedly... Um, uh, don't necessarily quote me on this. Don't just show up at the library on this day. Just double check. Uh, November 5th um, and subsequently Monday through Saturday from 1 to 5 p.m. But don't quote me on that. There's 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 going to be an it's going to be interesting kind of how uh, things are going to evolve. But for the most part, most of the rest of 2020 will be uh, relegated towards basically just going to the library being, ooh, ah, cool, this is a new library, and grabbing your book and getting on out of there. <laughs> it's a, it could be a short block, but they want to um, basically encourage people to uh, come see the new library. They want to show it off, but mostly be available for people to check things out, um, but not hang out at the library that long. I mean, that's kind of seeming like what it's going to be as we're transitioning into 2021. All right, so that's pretty much everything that I know. There's still a lot of information going out there, but I just want you guys to know um, as soon as I know 100% certainty when we'll open, I will tell you. But for right now, it's a, it's a big maybe on November 5th. So anyways, thank you guys for joining me. Um, this will not broadcast actually on the MCAT channel this week uh, because we're actually turning off our whole entire system um, on Thursday. Um, <laughs> and then we'll hopefully be able to turn back on on, uh, on Friday-ish or some kind of like, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting um, setup when we move over there. But all I know is that Friday is going to be our final push to go into the new library. Stay out of our way. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for joining me and for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ram. Take care, guys.